Good morning, church. It's so good to be with you today. If you're able, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing to our great King. The God who made us, the God who's for us, the God who's with us today. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who today 51 years as a community of faith, Whittier Area Community Church, formerly Whittier Area Baptist Fellowship, for those of you that remember Wabbath before WAC, 51 years God has seen us through. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to sing a song together, and this might be new to some of you. It's called Firm Foundation. 
It is just one of my favorites by Maverick City and uh, celebrates that we're strong and insecure. It's strong and secure because we're standing on the rock. Christ is my firm. Christ is my firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, rock, the rock on which I stand, everything around me shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. In the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the crazy, I've still got joy in chaos. I got peace. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. Cause I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. Cause he's there.
God, we thank you. God, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Corporately, for 51 years, and individually, for what you want to do in each of our hearts today.
Counselor, Prince of Peace, Firm Foundation. God, we need you every day. Every day. We come putting our hope and our trust in you. Because we know you are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good. It's so good to be with you today. Would you greet the people around you and then you may be seated. Well, hello there. Good morning. It's so good to be with you today. Hello, a special welcome to those of you online and those of you on the patio and of course all of you that are right here in the building. It's great to be with you today. If you're if you're brand new, uh, we would like to meet you. So make sure that you head out to Guest Central in the lobby right after service, or if you're online, go ahead and click that little button so we can get to know you a little bit, answer any questions that you have, uh, and give you a free gift. So welcome, we're glad you're here. Today is a very special day for us. We are celebrating 51 years. It's our anniversary as a church. Isn't that amazing? 51 years. We are so grateful for all of the ways that God has moved right here within Whittier Area Community Church over all those years. And it's pretty humbling to think about the impact that God has had through this church locally and globally. And we're so grateful for those of you that have been a part of this church from the very beginning until now. And gosh, we look forward to all the amazing things that God is going to do going forward. So one more round of applause, 51 years, that's pretty awesome. If you are new to WAC or if you've been attending for some time and you're thinking about what is my next step here, we would like to invite you to check out Next Steps. It's really aptly named. So Next Steps is a four-week program uh, that helps you get connected to other people. You can also learn about these awesome 51 years of our church. You can find out how you can use the amazing gifts that God has given you to serve this church and serve our community. You also get a cool backstage tour and you get to connect with some of our awesome pastors here at WAC. So next step starts today, like right now, over in the community center. Uh, so if you want to go, you may. None of us will judge you for getting up and leaving right now. But if you would like to stay and go next week, you can join us next week. Or at, at 11 as well. Or at 11, you can go at 11 too. We also have a Spanish option, if that would work better for you or for someone that you know. We started on Thursday, but we're going to connect again this next Thursday. Go ahead and check out our website for more information on that. Our WAC internship is an awesome way for you if you're interested in finding about how leadership in the church works, if you want to grow in your leadership within the church. So you can check it out if you feel like God nudging you, like I wonder what vocational ministry is all about, then you should check out our website to explore our internships or you can talk to Cynthia right outside in the lobby after the service. Now we're winding down, it's the end of summer. Uh, so as we're transitioning um, out of our summer activities and vacations and we're getting kids ready to go back to school, we have 
an end of summer movie night coming up for you. Our WAC Kids team have put together this super fun event. We want you to bring out your whole family, bring some blankets and chairs, bring some snacks to have a fun evening together to celebrate the end of summer. And now, speaking of end of summer, we would like to offer a special blessing as we head back into the school year. Um, some of you have already started school. Some of you are getting ready to start in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but we really want to offer a blessing over all of the administrators, teachers, students, homeschool parents, anyone who's working in the offices, our health and safety teams. Uh, we just want to pray that our kids and those individuals thrive this year. So John, would you come on over? Pray I'd love to. And Tara, you're... You're one of them too as well. You're, yeah, you're yeah. one of our educators in the community. So right now, would you stand up if you're going back to school as a student, if you're going to school as a teacher, educator, staff member, administrator, any form, and if you're near one of these people, would you, let's say thank you to them, absolutely. And if you came with one of these awesome educators or students, would you put your hand on their shoulder, maybe as a way just that we could bless them? Don't do it to someone you don't know. <laughs> please, please. But let's, let's pray a prayer of blessing together over these amazing men and women and students. So God, we thank you for new beginnings. And we ask right now for your blessing to fall on these brothers and sisters who are standing right now. God, may they sense the peace that passes understanding in the year ahead. For those who feel nervous, we ask for strength. For those who, God, are worried about the right friends this next year, would you bring the right people around them? God, we pray for each one of them, would you give them wisdom? Would you use them as a light in their classrooms and in their offices? And God, we pray that they would sense you with them throughout this year and others would sense you in them this year. We pray your name would be brought forth, God, through their life and through their conduct. So bless them and keep them and watch over them this next year. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen. Let's cheer these folks on one more time. Thanks, John. I, I know that I probably speak for those of you in the room that, that that special blessing was for, that we would appreciate your prayers all year long. Yeah. Um, we are going to enter a time of giving now, but we would like to recognize Paul and his family. Paul, are you in here? There you are. Congratulations. We're so excited for you. Paul and his family are going to be baptized today. And uh, so we're just, we're so excited for you. Thank you for letting us join you in this day. If you are a guest, you're, you're here for the first time, just let the baskets pass on by. But if you call Whack Your Church Home, know that your giving goes to support services just like this one, and also family events like VBS and the movie night coming up, and then of course, locally with our Racket Wag where we, we help those that are the most vulnerable in our community shop and live with dignity. So thank you for your, your blessing and your gift. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given us. Help us to give right back to you with open hearts, open hands and in abundance. We love you, God. In Jesus' powerful name we pray, amen. Calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh, I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. 
same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. Welcome again and happy anniversary to you today. Whether this is your first time or you've been here since the very first day, I believe God has you here for a reason and I'm so glad to be with you. Now, 51 years, there have been a lot of great things over the years that we can celebrate as we look back. 51 years ago, it was a time of joy starting on a really hot August Sunday with a group of 384 people who said, God, we just want you to use us in this community. There's joy that day. And then there was joy in 1975 when they ended up uh, coming to this campus and purchasing it, purchasing it years ago. They came and just worshiped uh, here in the field with no buildings that first time in 1975. And then you just look through the years, all these moments of joy. I was thinking about this past year, five months ago, when WAC was able to start our first Spanish service in WAC and Espanol. There's joy that Sunday back in, in April and March. And then every time, think about this, every time someone's baptized, like Paul's gonna be baptized today, there's joy. Every time our community is served, our world gets blessed through what you give and how you serve, there's joy. Every time someone makes a decision to accept the love of Jesus, we get to celebrate that with heaven and there's joy. There's so many things to celebrate over the past 51 years. And yet... 
Can we just be candid? Over the past 51 years, everything has not been fun and easy. There have been hard stuff over the past 51 years. There's so many of you who could think back to moments where there's been deep grief and loss in your life in this church family. There's people who started this journey with us who aren't here today, and we've grieved that. And then there's been tragedies over the years. Some of you were here in 1987 when the Whittier Narrows earthquake hit and damaged so many of your homes and damaged this church and, and the property in many ways. There's been tragic moments, and then there's been moments of great hardship because we live in a world where everything's not okay and the church is not immune from that, immune to the loss, to the anxiety, to the divisions, and that leaks in, that affects us. And it's affected us over the past couple years because these years haven't been easy. I was recently standing outside of the building just kind of greeting people on a Sunday and I had the same thing happen three times from three different people. These three times, someone came up to me and said, hey, you're getting some gray hair in there. <laughs> now, that's not uncommon. My kids tell me regularly, but the same day, three different people. And every single time I had this thought in my mind, it wasn't good. No, no it wasn't, that wasn't bad. <laughs> um, the thought in my mind was, yeah, that's what the last couple years will do to a person. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you that because you've lived through the last couple years. You've lived through the grief, you've lived through the isolation, you've lived through the anxiety and the division and all the uncertainty. It's done a number on some of us. It's done a number on your health. Maybe it's done a number on your relationships. Maybe it's been done a number on your soul, frankly. And maybe for some of you, it hasn't shown up in gray hair, but it's shown up in a lack of patience when you're driving that you, you didn't used to struggle with. Maybe for some of you, it's shown up in just the fatigue where like you, you don't go to things you used to go to. You're not committed to things that you used to be committed to. For some of you, I wonder if it's just shown up in your physical health. Like maybe in the past two years, actually no, in the past two years, some of you have had your first panic attack and you wonder, what was that? Some of you can't sleep at night. You're wondering, what's going on inside of me? Because there's a lot of joy in life, but, but there's some hard things these days. I read this week, 40% of the population is experiencing stress-related disorders from the effects of the pandemic. The past couple years have taken a toll on us, and, and that hasn't gone away yet. Recently in our world, there's been a lot of talk about countries using up their energy reserves and what will happen if they use up those reserves and things don't get better with some of the country relations. Friends, can we be frank? Most of us have used up our energy reserves in the past couple years. And we're often not going to be ready for what the next challenges that come are. And that is why... Today, we're in a series called Resilient. We're in a series where we're asking God for resilience in the season ahead. Now, last week, if you weren't here, we said that resilience is the ability to endure and bounce back from difficulties. Resilience is a strength that allows you to rebound. It's a strength that allows you after tragedy, adversity, significant stress, for you to bounce back and to adapt. Being resilient does not mean you never get stressed out. It doesn't mean you never struggle. It means when you go through the stressors and the struggles, you go through emotional pain and suffering, there's a strength inside of you that allows you to keep going. And I believe if you and I are gonna make it into the season ahead and we're gonna be the people God wants us to be, our own willpower is not gonna cut it. Uh, you know, you just, just gritting our teeth and holding on is not gonna cut it. We need resilience. And so this series is diving into scripture to find out how can you cultivate a resilient heart in an uncertain world. And for a lot of our series, we're gonna go to the words of Jesus and how he describes we find strength. And specifically, Jesus, in this passage we're gonna be looking at today, is talking about finding strength around the end of the age. Now, if you've never studied the Bible before, that's a phrase that describes the, the season around Jesus returning. Because what scripture says is Jesus was God's son who came to save us. He died on a cross for our sins, rose again to validate he is who he says he was. And then Jesus one day is going to return to make everything in the world right and ultimately to make everything new. And Jesus says around the time that he comes, there's gonna be a lot of turmoil. 
Now, the passages that we're studying in this series are called the Olivet Discourse by scholars. And if you're wondering, what does that mean? It just means he taught this on the Mount of Olives. Uh, And we have three recordings of this teaching in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, and in Luke 21. Last week, we looked at Mark 24, or Matthew 24, and we looked at how Jesus said, In all the difficulties of our lives, one of the first steps of finding resilience is mentally to make sure we don't get alarmed. Uh, Eugene Peterson put it like this, don't panic. Instead, keep your head in the right story. And last week we said the story that we need to keep our head in is the story that Jesus is on the throne of the universe. It's the story of God. Well, today we're gonna move to the Gospel of Luke And we're gonna learn a second, I think, practice all of us need to keep in our lives to build resilience. And it's so simple. Some of you already do it, but today you're gonna understand why it's so important. Today I wanna talk about the practice of praying for strength to overcome. That's it. I want you to learn how to pray for strength to overcome. Now, uh, we're gonna go in Luke chapter 21 and verse 29 through 36, but as you're turning there, let me just give you an overview. If you've never read the all of that discourse of what Jesus says, Jesus says, hey, there's gonna be some things that happen before I return, before we get to the end of the age. In verse eight, Jesus goes into things like fake messiahs, people who come and either say, I am the messiah, or they act like they're the messiah, and people should follow them. And Jesus warns, you know, keep Jesus as the, keep me as the one who's your Lord. He, he, I'm the one who should be the master. And then he goes on after that in verse 9 and 10. He talks about how there's going to be wars and uprisings. And friends, this has continued from when Jesus said it all the way through today. Uh, Will Durant is a historian. He says, war is one of the constants of history and is not diminished, even with civilization and democracy. In the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 260 years have seen no war. And sadly, what Jesus says is, don't panic. Those are going to keep coming until I return. Now, when the, we, don't, we wanna fight for peace, we wanna pray for peace, but we realize that that's gonna be happening. Now, Jesus goes on in verse 11, talks about natural disasters. Jesus says, hey, there's gonna be earthquakes. Don't panic, there's gonna be earthquakes. And, and a few decades after Jesus said this, this whole ancient city of Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake. And we see that earth, earthquakes keep happening up until our day. Uh, in the last couple decades, earthquakes, the big earthquakes, scientists are telling us actually are increasing and living in California. This doesn't surprise you, I know. Uh, Jesus goes on and talks about there's gonna be famines and plagues in many lands. And when you put together natural disasters and vulnerable people, this creates a lot of need. And again, as the church, we're called to respond and to help and to feed and clothe and care for people. And then Jesus says, interesting, he says, terrifying things and miraculous signs from heaven. We don't fully know what Jesus meant from there. Some people think, is he talking about lunar eclipses or solar eclipses or comets or meteor showers? We we don't fully know. But then Jesus goes on in verse 12. He says this, time of persecution. He says, but before all these things this, they will seize you and persecute you. you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors and all on account of me. And verse 12, that actually all started in the book of Acts, if you want to read that. Jesus' followers, these early Christians, they ended up being brought before Jewish and Roman officials and suffering, being put to death. And, and in our world today, there are still many parts of our world where there's persecution and there's danger for those who say, I follow Jesus in a culture that has another worldview. Now, sometimes in our day, there, I, I, let me just say, I think in our day, there's this view, and I wanted you to read all that because sometimes in our culture specifically, people think, well, there's tough things that will happen before Jesus returns, but God kind of spiritually bubble wraps anybody who loves him, right? God protects me. Nothing would ever happen to me. And then our bubble gets burst one day when something really hard does happen to us, and you wonder, doesn't the Bible say it's not gonna happen? No, Jesus says there's lots of crazy things that are gonna happen before I return, and don't be surprised, don't panic when those things happen. He goes on and talks about Jerusalem being destroyed. We saw last week in 70 AD that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman army that surrounded it. So as you can tell, tumultuous times 
have existed and will continue to exist. So how can you cultivate a heart that is resilient in all of this? Let's pick up in verse 29 where Jesus continues with the parable and then he gives us two instructions. Jesus told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know summer's near. Even so, when you see these things happening, I'm describing, you know the kingdom of God, when Jesus returns, is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation, and I'd say the generation who sees these things happening, will certainly not pass away until all these things finish happening. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And then listen to the two instructions. Verse 34, be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, we'll get to what that means, drunkenness and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the earth. Second command, be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So in this passage, Jesus gives two instructions, two commands. First one, real quickly, is he says, be careful. Be on your guard, he says. Why? Because in this season, it will be easy for your heart to be weighed down, your heart to be distracted, discouraged. And what does he say you'll get weighed down with? He says carousing. Now, another word for that could be intoxication, not just with alcohol, but intoxication with stuff, intoxication with cars, with things, with success, with money, with vacations. We fixate on things. He says, don't let your hearts get weighed down and distracted by that with drunkenness. This could be medicating with alcohol, medicating with food, medicating with things that are are destructive for you or your body, anxieties of life, worry, taking over. Jesus is saying being preoccupied with worldly pleasures and worldly worries can be like an anesthesia for your soul and one of the most important times to stay awake. It can be deadly. So Jesus says, be careful, stay alert. And then the second command is where I wanna camp with you today. It's in verse 36. Jesus says, pray that you might be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Pray. Now, I've read from the NIV translation. This is the translation I usually preach from, and I was reading it this week and realizing, I don't know if this translation is making clear what's really being said here. Because when I read this the first time, I read, okay, I'm supposed to pray, and I'm supposed to pray that I may be able to escape. And we already said this whole thing in the Bible is not about us being bubble wrapped and escaping all the difficult things in this world. So is that what Jesus is saying? Like, pray that you don't have to face that stuff? I don't think that's what he's saying here. And I'm actually pretty positive he's not saying that here because when you go to the Greek, which is what this is originally written in, you find out the words that are being used. And I think I'm gonna take you to the New American Standard Bible, which is pretty close to literal to the Greek, and so you can get a better picture. What are you supposed to pray for? Here's what Jesus says. He says, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says, praying that you may have strength. Strength. And he says, strength to escape. Strength to escape what? Not all the bad things happening. He's talking about have strength to escape being weighed down, distracted, giving up in the midst of all these hard things. Because right after it, he says, pray for strength to stand before the Son of Man. New Living Translation puts it like this. Pray that you might be strong enough. Strong enough to persevere in the storms ahead. Strong enough to endure in the circumstances that feel overwhelming. Strong enough to believe that God hasn't left you when other people leave you or when it feels like everything is falling apart. Friends, if we're gonna cultivate hearts that are resilient, you and I in the season ahead need to pray for the strength to overcome. 
And I want to just take a, a, a dive on what that means for our final moments. Because some of you, you read that and you think, okay, so I'm like supposed to pray for an optimistic view in the midst of this all? We're not talking about praying for optimism. We're not talking about praying for cheerfulness. We're talking about praying for a heavy duty, serious strength. The word strength here in the Greek is the word katiskuo. And katiskuo can be translated as strength for combat. Strength that allows you to be successful in a struggle. Katiskuo strength is strength that allows you to prevail when you're in the midst of a fight. It's an overcoming strength. Here's the way you understand it. Strength to overcome someone who's trying to be stronger than you. And you can prevail against them. Now, if you study the Bible, there's only one other time in the New Testament Jesus uses the word katiskuo. And it's found in Matthew 16, 18. Peter has just confessed, Jesus, you are the Lord. Like, you are the Son of God. And after it, here's what Jesus says. I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. In other words, the gates of hell will not katiskuo the church. The forces of hell will not be strong enough to prevail against the church of Jesus. Now, let me just put those two side by side because I want you to see the connection here. What this means when you're praying for strength. Again, the two times Jesus uses this word is he says, one, hell wants to katiskuo the church and it's not gonna happen. And the other one is saying, hey, you're in really tough days. You need strength to f- win this fight. And I want you to see the connection here is Jesus is saying, look, you are in the midst of a combat right now. And your combat is not with another human being. It's not with another political party or another ideology. You're in a fight with the evil one, the forces of hell. And he wants you to give up and he wants you to quit. And God wants to supply you with strength to actually win in that fight. And so you need to keep on the alert, praying that you have the strength to overcome. Now, one of the ways I think the enemy tries to cause us to not receive this strength is actually to convince us you don't need the strength. Because I think the enemy in our culture especially wants you to think you're not living in a conflict where you need God's strength. You're you're living in a safe, comfortable place. I think the evil one in American culture today wants us to believe you're living in a playground, not a battleground. Uh, Some of you know from July 1st, To July 3rd, 1963, or 1863, forgive me, our country faced the bloodiest battle it's ever seen on our territory in the war at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's estimated that there were 50,000 casualties on that that battleground. Uh, And by the way, if you do some studying, it wasn't just men fighting in that battle, it was women as well. And in that battle, we, historians tell us it was the turning point of the war. It ended up being a turning point for our entire country to become who we are. And if you've been to Gettysburg before, you know it, it's, it's pretty impressive to be there on that field and to think of what took place there. But I was doing some studying this past week. A strange thing happened almost 100 years later in 1959 on part of this battleground. And it's this. An amusement park was started there called Fantasyland 1863. It was an amusement park that grew to over 35 acres with 11 rides, four live shows, attractions, games, animals. Uh, You could go there to talk with costume characters like Raggedy Ann and Andy. Go see Little Bo Peep. Uh, The Easter Bunny would go there. Fairy princesses would be there. Uh, They had a Santa village, Santa's village there, Wild Wild West show. They would teach animals Uh, chickens and rabbits specifically how to play baseball and play the piano, apparently. Uh, Here's what the brochure says. This is is fantasy land, a world set apart, a world where stories and dreams of elves and fairies and all the storybook characters come to life in a beautiful setting with a gentle look of long ago. Because Gettysburg is all about a gentle look, right? I mean, so... This amusement park existed for a couple decades until 1980 when someone finally figured out maybe it's not appropriate to have an amusement park on this battlefield, and they moved it to Indiana. So I bring this up with you today because what the scriptures teach, friends, is you live your life on a battleground. 
Not a playground, not a picnic ground, not an amusement park. Peter wrote this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the evil one, he wants to devour you and destroy you. And part of his strategy, I think, in this culture is he wants you to think in the world that you're really living in that's really a spiritual battleground is just a fantasy land. No, this world is just a place where all your dreams can come true. You don't need to stay alert. You don't need any heavy-duty strength here. That's what he's telling us. And if you live believing that, your guard will be down, and he will take you down, and you probably won't know it until after it happens. One of the comments about the evil one in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, Daniel has all these visions of what's going to come. And one of the comments about the evil one is this, and he will speak against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. He will wear you down. The evil one would love for every single one of us to be weighed down and discouraged and to give up and to miss out on the fact that you need strength in the battle. And sadly, this is what Jesus said would happen before he returns. In Matthew 24, 10, after Jesus describes, hey, lots of tumultuous things are gonna happen, here's what he says. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Many will turn away. Another way you could translate this is many will fall away. And this is not just addressed by Jesus. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, the day Jesus comes back, will not come until the rebellion occurs. That word, the rebellion, is a Greek word, apostasia. We get our word apostasy from it, but literally what it means is until the falling away occurs. Now, there's a few different interpretations on what this means, but here's the most prominent is this, is that before Jesus comes back, there will be an undeniable mass departure of people from faith, people falling away from their devotion to Jesus. Throughout the pandemic, um, there's been this interesting trend that there's been a lot of literature written about called the great resignation. Some of you know this. There have been people who have resigned from their jobs in record numbers to find other jobs. Uh, sometimes people resign from their job and they move to a completely different place and they don't even have a job lined up yet, but they just know it's time to move on. I read in one study this week, there was a survey in June that was done and here's what they found. In June, they said one in five workers still say that they plan to leave their job in 2022. This year. I bring that up because I believe what Jesus is saying is before he comes back, there will be a great resignation from the faith. People will walk away from churches. People will leave their spiritual practices. People might give up on their commitment to Jesus. Does Jesus give up on them? No, but they give up and they just walk away. Now, if you wonder why in the world would anyone ever walk away from a commitment to Jesus? Well, sometimes I think it's because we get distracted. Sometimes I think there's just this drift that can take place, and I'm, I'm preoccupied with other things. Maybe for sometimes it's, it's because people, their devotion gets turned not to Jesus, but to a human leader or to a human movement. That's where they put their hope. I personally wonder, though, whenever this happens, however this happens, if a lot of it will come from disappointment and heartache and fatigue, because when we get worn out, we don't think clearly, do we? And sometimes we wonder, is God really there after all? Does God really care about us in all that we're going through? And so again, what does Jesus say we need to do to be prepared? He says, keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough. Pray for the strength to overcome, to overcome the fatigue, to overcome being weighed down, to overcome your enemy's attacks. Ask for the strength to be resilient which you need to know means that the strength to be resilient then is a gift granted by God. Resilience is given to you, imparted to you, bestowed on you, which means you should ask for it. Jesus says to. So here's my challenge for you this week. It might be very simple, and some of you are thinking, I do that already. I'm gonna challenge you to do it more. Here's the challenge. Will you pray each day asking for God to give you his strength to overcome? Jesus said, pray that you might have strength so that you can stand faithful. Would you be willing every day to take time to connect with God and say, God, 
You're the one who's in charge. You're the center of the story. I need your strength to overcome. And as you do this, I told you last week, if you don't have a place in your Bible you're reading, read Psalm 23. Uh, This week, if you need a place to read over and over again, I wanna challenge you to read Psalm 18. It's a little bit longer than Psalm 23, but I love how it begins. It begins with these words. I love you, Lord, my strength. The scriptures teach that not only will God give you strength, but he is your strength. And if any of you are thinking, does he, is, he, is he really looking to give strength to me? I, I love what the, one of the prophets in Second Chronicles said. He said, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God today is looking at every one of us and he's saying, I would love to give you strength. Would you just commit yourself to me? Would you turn to me? And in the pressure of the days we're facing, I think every single one of us, we need this strength. And for any of you who think, but John, my body is really failing and emotionally I'm really struggling and my relationships are really fractured. Could I still experience the strength of God? Listen to the words of Asaph in Psalm 73. He says, my health may fail. And my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. God can still give you strength no matter what you're facing today. And then here's what's really amazing. The strength is not gonna take very long to get to you. The strength doesn't need to be FedEx from heaven. What we don't often realize is the strength is already inside of you. Not because of some self-help book you read that you think, I can produce it. No, the strength is inside of you because the Holy Spirit's already inside of you. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 3. Paul prays, I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. You might not know this, you have an inner being. And right now it's tired and it's depleted. And in that inner being, if you follow Jesus, has already been placed God's spirit. The same spirit that brought Jesus back from the dead lives in you. And the Holy Spirit wants to strengthen you in your inner being if you'll ask him to. So this week, pray for the strength to overcome. Turn your heart to God. Say, God, I love you. Jesus, you're my hope. I need your strength. You're gonna need it for the season ahead. Let me, let me close with this. Uh, a few months ago, I had the chance to run my first ever marathon. Now, I've enjoyed distance running throughout my life, but I've never even gotten close to running that long of a distance. And so I was so grateful for a few expert friends who gave me advice about here's what you need to do, here's what you don't do, here's how you train, here's what to expect when you get there that day that helped me reach the finish line. Now, in that guidance, there was this one tip that just kind of caught me off guard. I was glad to receive it, but it caught me off guard. A marathon, as you know, is 26.2 miles. And here was the guidance. Don't run over 20 miles in your training. Now, when I heard that, I'm like, thank you. But like, I was thinking, really? And so I went on and started like Googling and yeah, you're not supposed to run over 20. And some people say 21 miles in your training. But here's what that means. When you get out there on that race day, you don't really know what you're getting into in the last six miles. It's kind of like this uncharted territory. In the last six miles, you might hit a wall, and I hit a wall. Your knees might start hurting really bad, and my knees started hurting really bad. You might cramp up everywhere. I was cramping up everywhere. You don't know exactly what's going to happen in the last six miles, but you know it's going to be tough. And this is why I train, and this is why I listen to the guidance I'm being given. Church, I don't know when Jesus is gonna come back, but there are some days it feels like we're in that last six-mile part of the marathon. We don't fully know what's gonna come next. There's lots of twists and turns in the season ahead, but Jesus has told us what we can do to be resilient. He's told us what we can do to make sure we have the strength to cross that finish line, And that is to stay alert, and that is to keep praying for the strength to overcome. Pray for katasku'o strength. This is not a playground you're living in. This is a battleground, but we know who wins the battle in the end. So let him help you today. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are victorious that you will overcome all evil in the end. 
But as we live in these days, God, right now, we, we need your help. And just with your eyes closed and your head bowed right now, if you need to ask God for strength, do it. Just say, God, I, I feel it. I feel the battle right now. Give me your katasguo strength. Give me strength to fight the temptations. Give me strength to hold on to hope. Give me strength to keep serving and loving when I'm tired. Just tell him, Jesus, you're my savior. You died on the cross for my sins. I believe you put your Holy Spirit inside of me. So Holy Spirit, would you renew and release the strength inside of me every day this week? God, that's our prayer. Would you now use us in your story until Jesus, you come again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, we right now get to close our service with the best part, with having Paul be baptized and to declare his faith for all to see. And so when Paul comes in, he's gonna be dipped under the water, which represents Jesus dying for our sins. And then when he comes out of the water, it's gonna represent the resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. And uh, when Paul does this, we're gonna cheer for him and we're gonna clap for him and we're gonna pray for him. So let me pray right now as Paul gets ready to get in. Let's pray. So God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for the opportunity to witness what you're doing in Paul's life. We pray he would sense your spirit that when he's baptized, he would be filled with your spirit and filled with your love, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul, we're so excited for you, man. Paul, can I ask you, have you made the decision to ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Awesome. Well, it's because of that faith, it's now our honor to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations, Paul. God bless you. Well, friends, if you need prayer today, there's a team who will be at the front of the auditorium to pray for you, and there's a team online who will pray for you there. God bless you. Have a great week, everyone.